The plan to demolish Victoriaville marches forward. An update on the work to tackle homelessness. And the province considers easing more pandemic restrictions. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Catalina Gillies. And I'm Ryan Bonazzo. A major step toward the demolition of Victoriaville Mall will be voted on by Thunder Bay City Council on Monday. Administration is recommending more than a million dollars be allocated for a detailed design plan. A related report will also be presented with a timeline for the work needed to clear Victoria Avenue of the mall and reopen it to traffic. Corey Nordstrom has the details. In what is likely a formality for the city in its quest to tear down the aging and costly Victoriaville Mall, Council will vote to approve funds for a detailed design plan. It comes at a cost of nearly $1.3 million and will also include surveying, environmental and geotechnical work. Council voted unanimously in favor of demolishing the structure last year. McKellar Councillor Brian Hamilton is confident that Monday's vote will run a similar course, noting the significance of the project. All the community should be really excited that this is like a once in a generation opportunity to really reimagine uh, the downtown South Core and, uh, you know, the adjacent neighborhoods as well. Assuming Monday's vote passes, the city's manager of Realty Services provided some of the timelines for the big project. The report's approved, then we would um, proceed to tender. And uh, that's a process that um, generally takes uh, two or three months. I mean, the documents are for the most part ready once council approves the funding. And um, then the design would likely take a year. Administration is recommending the design funds be taken from the land development account. The total project is slated to cost just under $12 million, but that number could grow. I'm really looking at expanding the scope of this project to really kind of look at the adjacent communities, you know, from Sill Street to the East End to Cameron Street. Um, you know, what can we do to further uh, fortify those communities? And um, because ultimately those are going to be the, the big customer base that's going to support the downtowns. Physical work is planned to start in 2023, with a few years of work required before Victoria Avenue is reopened to through traffic. It would take um, an entire construction season to do work uh, to the, the uh, buildings that are within the mall to get them ready for the exterior exposure. Uh, you know, a season to demolish the center and a season to build the street and the public spaces. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. Meanwhile, Mayor Bill Morrow is providing an update to Council on Monday night regarding the development of a response protocol for situations like the homeless encampment at County Fair Mall. He says the protocol will help local agencies ensure there are no gaps left to address. The update from the mayor comes after he met with more than a dozen social services agencies and other partners, including the DSAB and Matawa. Morrow points out that homelessness is a provincial matter, but he knows people are looking to City Hall for answers. The goal for the city and partner agencies is to establish an effective and compassionate protocol that outlines roles and responsibilities when an encampment is identified. But it's a difficult problem to solve for Thunder Bay and for all municipalities. You know, I'm not suggesting that my hoping to bring together a formal protocol you know, I'm not suggesting for a second this is going to solve the problem, but it's one of the things that I'm hopeful can make the situation better. Plans to fence off the encampment were recently put on hold after one of the organizations received additional funding to help those who stay under the roof of the former Sunny's gas bar. Morrow says he doesn't know if the city still plans to install that fence once that funding runs out. There are no new COVID-19 cases being reported today by either of the two health units that serve Northwestern Ontario. There's still one active case in the Thunder Bay District and two active cases in the Northwestern Health Unit catchment area. Meanwhile, the province is reporting 417 new infections today as the positivity rate has fallen to its lowest level since August. The Ford government is expected to announce tomorrow that it will further ease pandemic restrictions in Ontario. Colin DeMello has the details. 
The intense pressure dished out by the restaurant industry has forced the premier to pivot. The province is now ready to lift physical distancing restrictions for the sectors that have vaccine requirements in place. That's a decision of cabinet and as I said, relying on the best uh, medical advice and scientific advice and we continue to monitor so we'll have more to say. Sources say the Ford government is working on a phased approach to lifting pandemic restrictions. The initial phase would see capacity in bars, restaurants and gyms return to pre-pandemic numbers. It is possible now, health experts say, because the worst of the fourth wave never emerged. We're doing rather well. I mean, our hospital system is not overwhelmed with uh, cases with patients uh, suffering from COVID-19. Our daily case count is pretty reasonable. The percent positivity is pretty reasonable. Here's how the chief medical officer of health is planning the exit. First, he wants to examine the impact of the Thanksgiving long weekend. The trends are good at present. We still have to wait for the next 7, 14 days uh, of what the impact uh, of this long weekend has been. Then Dr. Moore says he wants to prepare the pandemic exit strategy. We'll be able to provide guidance uh, to both businesses uh, and uh, to the community at large of when we see from a public health vantage point uh, some of the measures could be removed. Uh, we will not be doing this suddenly. This will be slow gradual and cautious following data like we've been doing for the last year and a half. But CTV News has also learned as part of this phased approach, the vaccine certificate requirement will eventually be phased out. Beginning next week, businesses will have access to a verifier app that can scan QR codes carrying your vaccination information. While that will be a mainstay over the fall and winter months, sources say as the situation improves, vaccine certificates will eventually be voluntary. We may not require them in some venues, but still require them in mass gatherings where we have a, a, a large number of people gathering. While the changes are being welcomed by the restaurant industry, critics have their questions. What's been the holdup? Uh, why did Doug Ford uh, give a, you know, give a, a bit of a, a gift to the big fish? Uh, well, mom and pops and local businesses uh, have, you know, have had to wait uh, and are wondering why they got treated differently. The chief medical officer of health is offering this. Some of these decisions are made quickly, and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry if there's been short notice to some. But serving up no apologies to the beleaguered restaurant industry for keeping the pandemic measures in place. Ontario's COVID-19 vaccine verification app that you heard about there for businesses is now available to download. The province has confirmed the Verify Ontario app has been rolled out on Google Play and Apple app stores this afternoon. It will give businesses and organizations the ability to scan and verify QR codes on the province-issued vaccine certificates. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is expected to announce his new federal cabinet on either October 25th or 26th. And Health Minister Patty Haidu is waiting patiently to see where she'll end up next. Haidu has been in cabinet for six years, starting out as the Minister of the Status of Woman in 2015. She was promoted to Minister of Labour in 2017. And then in November 2019, just before the pandemic hit, she was promoted again to Federal Health Minister. As for whether she keeps that role or moves again, Haidu says she trusts Trudeau to make the right decisions. I think what that um, demonstrates to the Prime Minister, hopefully, is that I'm flexible and I'm also interested in a lot of different kinds of um, public policy development. There's been some debate about whether Trudeau should keep the same Minister of Health until the pandemic is over. Haidu says she'll do whatever is asked of her, but says there's no shortage of qualified people to choose from if she were to be moved. We've done a lot of collaboration across the government. So we had, as you know, a COVID committee where um, ministers from uh, all the relevant uh, files came together to really look at the decisions we were making and try to make the absolute best ones we could using a variety of different perspectives. Uh, so there are a lot of people within our own uh, government that have had quite extensive experience with COVID-19. Haidu adds there is still other work to do as a government, and whatever cabinet post she receives, she plans to continue being a strong voice for Northwestern Ontario. There's now been a third incident in just a month of a vehicle blowing the stop sign at high speed at Sistinen's Corner. This time it was a car. It happened at around 5 o'clock Tuesday morning. The vehicle crashed in a field after swerving through the Petro-Canada card lock station. 
OPP say the driver, a 27-year-old man from Winnipeg, appears to have fallen asleep at the wheel. He's been charged with careless driving and driving without a license. The Thunder Bay DSAB is working to fix two elevators at the Jasper Place apartment complex. Issues with the electronic systems have caused one elevator, and sometimes even both of them, to be out of service at various times in recent months. The 100-unit supportive housing building is for people aged 60 and over. One of the elevator remains offline this week pending repairs. In the past, the elevators required service only once or twice a month, but the service calls increased to 8 in August, 14 in September, and 12 during the first two weeks of October. DSAB Corporate Services Director Georgina Daniels says the breakdown rate is at the point where they've decided to update the electronic controls sooner than previously planned. It could take several months and she says they're trying to their best to minimize the convenience to the residents and their families. Officials with the local Operation Red Nose say the program will not be offered during the 2021 holiday season. It's been cancelled for a second straight year due to the COVID-19 and the concerns around the pandemic. The free safe ride service involves volunteers driving party goers and their vehicles home on weekends during November and December. The program has been operated by St. John Ambulance since 2009 and usually brings in about $15,000 to $25,000 a year in donations. That money goes directly to St. John's community service units. Volunteer and fund development coordinator Brian Edwards says losing that funding is yet another hit for the organization. He adds it was heartbreaking for the staff and volunteers to hear that Red Nose has been cancelled again, but the message will live on. It's being around like-minded people that have that, that community safety message behind them. Uh, so even though we're physically not running Operation Med Red Nose, that message of Red Nose is still there, right? So that's, that's never going to go away. Uh, but we just need to uh, emphasize that that message will still be there even if we're physically not running it this year. Edwards says next year they're going to plan well in advance in order to mitigate risks and hopefully bring Operation Red Nose back to Thunder Bay. Thunderbird Raptor Rescue has made some progress securing a new space. Owner Jen Salo has been rehabilitating birds of prey out of her home for years. And with the increasing number of calls she's getting, she's close to finding a facility big enough to take her rescue to the next level. Danielle Bain has the story. Jen Salo created Thunderbird Raptor Rescue for one purpose, to rehabilitate injured birds of prey and release them back into the wild. Right now, she has been experiencing a huge number of calls from all around northwestern Ontario and thinks it's because of one main reason. We are at the beginning of migration season and uh, it's also hunting season, so we're seeing lots of birds that uh, get exposed to lead uh, from gut piles and from you know, like par partridge that have been shot but got away, that kind of thing. When they're not feeling good, that's when the injuries happen. Right now, Salo has four different birds that she's caring for. Two eagles, a peregrine falcon, and a broadwing hawk. It might seem like a low number, but the rehabilitative space required for these birds to thrive is large. Over the last three years, Salo has been working towards securing some space at Chippewa Park, which she says will be hugely beneficial for these birds. I have limited space for uh, the larger birds as it is, so having that space will help me be able to answer more calls, it will give me an opportunity to do better with the whole recovery process of having those flight pens for building muscle at the end stage before release. Salo hopes to secure that space within the next few months after finishing paperwork with the city, and once she does, her next focus will be on fundraising so that she can take in as many birds as possible. Danielle Bain, TBT News. Well, great story there, and uh, good job on Danielle for being able to hold up that bird while doing her stand-up. She impressive. was definitely quite brave <laughs> yeah. for doing that. Well, Mitch, when I looked out my window this morning, I was hopeful. It looked pretty nice out, but looks like the weather has gotten a little worse throughout the day. Yeah, it did start very nice this morning. If you're an early worker around 9, you'd wake up to temperatures of 15 and pretty sunny. If you're expecting that to last throughout the day, you'd be definitely wrong as the clouds came in later in the afternoon and continued and brought some winds from the southwest of 14 to 40 kilometers, bringing the temperature slightly down to 12. Now in the province, similar temperatures and the feeling of fall. 
with Kenora, Dryden, and Fort Francis all seeing clouds throughout the day at 9, 8, and 10, while Atacokan and Uppsala at a nice even 10 also seeing on and off rain throughout the day. In the northwest, that continues in Red Lake, Sioux Lookout, Pickle Lake, and Big Trout Lake, all at lucky number 11. The clouds continued with the on and off rain. There is a system going through the province that we'll look at later in the news hour with Uppsala at 10. Armstrong, though, at 13. They saw uh, clouds throughout the day, but not too much rain, while Greenstone on and off rain with clouds. Now, slightly different in Marathon, 13. They saw clouds throughout the day, no rain, while Sault Ste. Marie had some weather going all over the place, started cloudy, cleared up in the afternoon, and then had some rain, currently sunny once again. Tonight, what can you expect in Thunder Bay? You can expect temperatures of 9, those clouds still sticking around, while the clouds, uh, the rain, expected to have mild showers throughout the night with those winds at from the southwest, 13 to 28 kilometers. So maybe not the best night for an evening walk, but a good night to splash in some puddles. Thanks a lot, Mitchell. Well, we heard a little bit earlier about the COVID-19 situation here in Ontario. Pretty good news. The province is considering uh, easing up on some restrictions. That is not the case in Saskatchewan, where they have uh, the lowest vaccination rate in the country and their hospitals are teetering on the brink. We'll have more on the situation across the country as your Thursday news hour continues. It's to a point where we have to move people out of province, then we will to be able to maintain that quality of care.
Depending on where you look in this country, there's a drastic contrast in how dire the COVID situation is. Yeah, no better evidence of that than the fact that Saskatchewan is in talks with Ontario about possibly transferring ICU patients as this province looks to further ease restrictions. Vanessa Lee has the latest. In Saskatchewan, the province that currently has the highest COVID-19 death rate in the country, doctors say they are overwhelmed and understaffed. Still, the health minister insists they are managing on their own for now. If it gets to a point where we have to move people out of province, then we will to be able to maintain that quality of care. And that's why we've been able to work with Ontario. And we're also, our officials have reached out to Manitoba to have those discussions as well. Help has arrived in Alberta to ease some of the pressure on hospitals hard hit by the crisis. A team of seven health workers from Newfoundland and Labrador are now in Fort McMurray, allowing that hospital to increase its ICU capacity. Of 652 recent infections, 73% are not fully immunized. The Premier says vaccines are mandatory in a number of fields, including the military and health care. To allow staff who have a higher risk of transmission of a potentially lethal disease to their patients not to get vaccinated would, I think, be legally irresponsible. CTV News has learned Ontario is considering further easing restrictions as the situation improves. That province is reporting its lowest positivity rate since August. The move would likely see capacity limits lifted for places like restaurants and gyms. I do believe we can lift um, measures uh, in a proportionate way, uh, in a timely fashion uh, and slowly uh, to allow our economy to fully uh, uh, recover. Quebec has just announced bars and restaurants will be able to operate at full capacity starting November 1st. Normal operating hours will also be allowed, meaning bars can stay open until 3 a.m. Vanessa Lee, CTV News, Montreal. Deputy Prime Minister Christia Freeland is in Washington. She was asked today about the United States' decision to finally reopen the land border to fully vaccinated Canadians in November. This was her response to a question about whether our northern border should have been treated separately than that of Mexico and if the special relationship between Canada and the U.S. still exists. I think that we need to be respectful of every other country's sovereign decisions around its own borders and of every other country's sovereign right to manage its borders as it sees fit. Having said that, I think it's also worth pointing out that Canada has a very effective, very close partnership with the United States. There's still no specific date on when the border will reopen. Canadians will also still need to get a PCR test when they return back home from the U.S. Now an update on the water crisis in the capital of Nunavut. A plane from Ottawa carrying around 80,000 litres of clean water has landed in Iqaluit. Residents have been scrambling to get clean water anywhere they can. Municipal trucks have been collecting river and river water and treating it with chlorine. The city declared a state of emergency Tuesday after a fuel smell was detected at the water treatment plant. The Transportation Safety Board says it has found no link between any train activity and the Lytton, B.C. wildfire that devastated that community. The TSB's months-long investigation results refute residents' allegations that passing trains with CN or CP rail might have started the fire. I went down, did a complete walk around the train uh, looking for any signs of um, like burnt brake heads or uh, hot bearings or, or anything that would look like that could have caused or started a fire. Um, I inspected uh, every wheel set, uh, brake beam, uh, also looked uh, as much as I could without having to be able to climb on top at, at the locomotives. Um, just did not see anything that, that jumped out at me. Service continues its investigation into the fire that engulfed more than 90% of Lytton, B.C. 
Norway's security agency says a bow and arrow attack that killed five people appears to have been an act of terrorism. Four women and a man were killed in the attack Wednesday, which started inside a supermarket. Two others, including an off-duty police officer, were also injured. Paul Workman has more. Well, he um, has been living in this town for quite some time. He apparently converted to Islam at some period in the past. And the police have, in fact, talked to him a number of times about being radicalized. And that is their theory in this case, that he became a, became a serious threat as a result of his beliefs. It was a frightening rampage through a very small town in Norway. It's close to Oslo. It's a, like a, a, a suburb. And it happened around 6 o'clock last night. People saw a man standing on a corner in front of a supermarket taking shots at people with a bow and arrows. The police responded. They lost him. They chased him, but they lost him. And then in a period of about a, an hour or so later, over an hour, he managed to shoot again with his bow and arrow and killed five people, four women and one man. So just a really a frightening, harrowing experience overnight. Police responded, they thought, very quickly. They had about 20 patrol units on the ground, but it took them a while to find this man. An advisory panel of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has been meeting to discuss booster shots for Americans who got COVID-19 vaccines from Moderna and Johnson & Johnson. The Biden administration has been pushing for boosters for all Americans six months or more after their last vaccine dose. Rena Roy has more on that. More Americans may soon be getting another jab of a COVID-19 vaccine. An FDA panel of experts meeting to discuss whether to recommend a third shot of the Moderna vaccine. We discussed it a fair amount internally. Um, the, the question is, some people are at greater risk of getting COVID-19, right, because they are just constantly exposed. The booster, half the dose for most Americans, and given six months after the second shot. Friday, the panel will discuss Johnson & Johnson, the drug maker suggesting a second shot between two and six months after getting the single-dose vaccine. Following this first step, the FDA and CDC will have to sign off on both boosters before they get the green light. Already, more than one out of three eligible seniors have gotten their third shot, the booster. And we're going to continue to provide that additional protection to seniors. President Biden urging more people to get their initial shots, especially ahead of colder months. The vaccination rate at one of its lowest points since shots were rolled out 10 months ago. We have to do more to vaccinate the 66 million unvaccinated people in America. Meantime, mixing different vaccines has been a topic of discussion amongst health experts. And now new data from the National Institutes of Health says in early studies it appears to be safe and may be effective, but that more research is needed. As for kids ages 5 to 11, Pfizer's vaccine could get that emergency use authorization in just a few weeks. President Biden says they're standing by and ready to go, with the federal government already purchasing enough vaccines for all American children in that age group. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. The U.S. House Intelligence Committee is wrapping up its investigation into the insurrection from January 6. Some of former President Trump's top aides have refused to testify, opening themselves up to possible charges. Elizabeth Schulze has the story. A show of defiance that could result in criminal charges for some of former President Trump's most loyal allies. Former Trump advisors Steve Bannon and Kash Patel refusing to show up for depositions today in front of the House Select Committee investigating the January 6th insurrection. Now committee members say they'll pursue criminal contempt charges against Bannon, which would...